So maybe I want to start by saying that you have actually, uh, it is the first uh, solo show in Paris. Um, we, we have seen a bit your work in Fondation Vuitton, in La Maison Rouge, in La Monnaie actually, where I show uh, part of your work. Um, and there is a room of your work uh, actually in Centre Pompidou show called Global Resistance uh, right now. Um, so there's a little part of you, uh, I'm actually two, two shows of you in Paris right now, which is, I think is a very important event. And I hope that um, the public will visit uh, Global Resistance as well as Dominique Fiat show. So maybe to start, I want to uh, remind um, uh, visitors that you have been trained as a printmaker in the United States and came back then in, uh, uh, in Cape Town and became very quickly an artist and both an activist. Um, and uh, very quickly uh, worked in both these direction or integrated them into your work. And the fact that you have been a journalist is visible in your work where you use a lot of archives, a lot of um, uh, souvenirs, um, photos or objects from the past. And they come into a dialogue with the present. And this dialogue with, within uh, present and future and past and present is very important, very uh, um, central in your work. And maybe the last thing I would like to say as an introduction is the fact that you want always to address your audience, to understand the point of view of your audience. And today your audience is French. And um, maybe what I would like to do is to uh, help this French audience to understand your work as well as the story of um, South Africa. And so maybe we're going to talk about both of these so that the visitors can understand how your work dialogue with your own national history. So um, maybe we start with the most historical work in the show, uh, which would be um, maybe a few South African. Maybe you can say a few words about uh, that, that series uh, well, in 1981. Yes, well, that the series A Few South Africans isn't on this show, but two works that I made right. that are on the show were mm -hmm. made as a preparation for that. It's the two works which are called Reverend Carney mm -hmm. and Mrs. Mtlabiti. And they are works that I made while I was working as an activist in Crossroads, visiting people, organizing events, trying to organize actions which would bring the um, state of Crossroads to the attention mm -hmm. of a wider audience. Crossroads was a squatter camp just outside the Cape Town airport where people were trying to live as families while the government, the apartheid government didn't want them to live there and was constantly threatening them with demolition. And um, we were trying to prevent the demolition and I spent a long time talking to people. But I was also working as an artist at the same time. So while I was talking to people, I would also be sketching. And sometimes I would take out very small etching plates with me to crossroads with a hard ground on them. And um, I would start drawing directly into these little plates and then work some more onto them when I got back to the studio. And basically these little works were stories of people who were at crossroads. Reverend Carney was the minister of the Methodist church and um, he said that in the Bible, people were supposed to live together as husband and wife, and he couldn't understand why they were being mm -hmm. persecuted. So I would get people to write little statements in my sketchbook and incorporate those as screen printed statements in the works themselves. Um, so those were the earliest works, yes. yes. And um, as a transition, you often say how the personal illuminates the political. So we, we find a lot of portraits in your work. And there's another uh, historical series in the show uh, coming from a series called All All Mothers. And maybe you want to say a few words about that very important series of work, which is also a series of portraits. Yes, I think it is true that I always think that the story of the individual so often illustrates the larger political picture. Mm -hmm. And when you hear what one's person, one person's experience is, it's easier to understand the situation. And All Our Mothers, it actually got its title when I was in New York at the Museum of Modern Art. 
and um, our vice president at the time came to visit a show of South African prints. And when I was introduced to him, I didn't think that he would know who I was. But he said to me, oh, you're the artist who made, who made the portraits of all our mothers. And I thought then that, that must, I must take that title and go through all my old archives, all the old black and white photographs of women that I had taken over the years and make that series. So um, it's a series which is still growing actually because every now and again, I meet somebody else from that time or I meet up with them again mm -hmm. and make a new portrait. But the ones that are on the show, there are four. There's one of um, somebody called Annie Salenga, who was a very brave woman. Um, part of the, one of the themes of the show is the passbooks that every black South African had to carry, an identity document. If they didn't have the identity document on their person, they could be stopped by the police and arrested immediately. And um, so they were a cause of enormous distress. People hated them. But Annie, as a matter of principle, even though she knew she would be arrested, refused to carry one because she said that only black people had to carry them. Why should she have, why should she? She would carry one when the prime minister's wife herself carried mm -hmm. one. So she was very famous for that. And um, there's also, then Annie died a few years after I took the, the photograph. And I was asked to make a work which reflected on that earlier work. And we, I decided to make a grave for Annie. She'd been buried in a graveyard without a headstone, without a proper grave, just a little wooden cross. So the photo of Eslina Salinga on the exhibition shows is one in which Eslina and I were walking around Lunga graveyard, looking at the different styles of graves and, and talking about the grave that we would make for Annie. So each one of the photographs in this series has a kind of a relationship to me finding out about that person or my mm -hmm. relationship with the person. And, you are, it, and it, it made you, I think, pretty famous in the 1990s because you were the first artist to talk both about racism and the importance of women, some kind of feminism, and maybe you want to, uh, to um, say a few words about that, how engaged you were involved very early on uh, to support women and the, how to make them visible in history within your work. Yes, I wouldn't like to say I was the first. Perhaps I can say that I was one of, one of the one first. Of the but it did seem to me that women were sidelined all the time, that they were playing a very important role in the struggle for liberation. And um, they weren't getting, they were always there fighting in the background, very often stronger than the men, mm -hmm. but not getting the credit for it. So I started a series called A Few South Africans, which honored these women. And I mean, I have always been particularly interested in the role of woman, it's true. And those, the portraits that I made, I also made into postcards. And the postcards became very widely distributed, not only in South Africa, but also abroad. And to this day, I still get people telling me they've got an old set of those postcards on their fridge, or they've got them on the wall. So I that they're, yeah, they're still around. Yeah. So another important um, persona, in a way, in your work are not only the persons, but the places. And you give a lot of importance to places, uh, to houses that have been sometimes destroyed. And I would like you to talk about another series, also an historical series. Um, I think it's, uh, the work is Last Supper of Manne Villa. It uh, is dated 1981. And it's about uh, the destruction of places due to a uh, law in 1966 called the Group Area Act. Maybe yes, that's right. Um, it's the story of the, the demolition of an area, a part of Cape Town, very close to the center of the city called District 6. And District 6 was a mixed race area. It was, sort of, it was very well located, with it, seated on the side of the mountain, looking down towards the sea. But because it was mixed race, the government thought that it would be better if it was for white people only. 
So in the 60s, they issued an order that everybody had, would, was going to have to move. And gradually they just started demolishing streets and moving people out. And La Separate Manly Villa is the story of one of the, the homes, the home of Naz Ibrahim and her husband, Harry. And they were one of the last families. And Naz was a very resilient, a very courageous person who constantly defied the authorities and very articulate. She would have news crews over there. She'd talk about what was going on. And in 1981, they were preparing, she was preparing the Feast of Eid to end Ramadan. And there was a knock on her door and it was one of the Bantu authorities handing out an eviction notice. So she slammed the door in his face and she wrote on the wall of her house, welcome to the last supper. And she invited everybody who came into the house to write their memories, their jokes, whatever they wanted to, they could write on the, on the walls of the house. And the house became filled, all the walls with these messages and memories. And so that, that, that and those photographs were taken on and around that day. I was actually making an installation at the time called The Last Supper in which I was picking up large pieces of rubble directly from the demolition sites and piling them in a gallery. And um, so, in fact, I only made this piece, The Last Supper at Manly Villa, many years later. And strangely enough, I had an email from Naz's daughter two days ago to say that Naz would have been, I think, 98 this week. Was it 98? 94 this week. So, yeah, she's still very much remembered in the history of Cape Town. That's a nice coincidence. So it also shows that you, your work is moving from uh, prints and, and photos to a three-dimensional uh, dimension, um, which brings me to another work in the show in Dominique Fiat um, called Long Journey of Brothers Ngezi, um, where you show trunks. Um, and I, I couldn't really say, reading the text about that series, what, what, what it relates to in terms of dates or, or history. Is it about today or is it about the past? I'm not completely sure. It's about the past again. Mm -hmm. It's about, again, this past book that I was talking about in the story of Annie Salinga. Every black South African had to carry this past book. And the past book was divided into sections. There were sections which stated where that particular person could live. He could only live in certain districts, who was employing him, whether he'd paid his taxes. So you could tell everything about a person just by flipping through this passbook. And if your passbook was not up to date, if it didn't have the right tax stamps, if it didn't have the right signatures, you could be jailed instantly. So of course people hated them. And this piece is about the, these two particular passbooks, these brothers, the Ngesi brothers, still had theirs. For 30 years, they'd had it on them constantly. But one day I met Mr. Ngesi and I asked him if I could borrow his passbook for a project I was doing. And um, he said to me, you can have it. So I said, no, 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 uh, give me your phone number. I'm going to bring it back to you. But when mm -hmm. I took it back to him, he said he, he didn't want it back. And I realized that by the time I borrowed it, he no longer legally had to carry it, but just this fear of never having it with him. He still had it after all those years. And it tells the history of a whole life. I mean, every single page or almost every page has these signatures and stamps. It's a complete history. And the trunks refer to the um, trunks which the mine workers used to carry in, used to have in hostels to store all their possessions. And so in a sense, they would have those with all their possessions, but they also had to carry around these passbooks. So it's about the kind of the burden that the passbooks were for people. And sometimes you go, you go even further in the past um, in, a, in a pretty terrifying uh, series in the show called, um, I don't even, I've lost the title. It's, it's from, uh, you're using tourist brochure. Oh yes. Um, from 1936. Uh, which uh, explains that South Africa is a tourist paradise. And then you, you're going through that in, uh, in a very critical way. And this is a piece dated 1992. 
Yes. It's again, it's about language and text. I'm always interested in deconstructing texts and taking items which may look quite ordinary, a passbook, a guidebook, and just trying to read what the subtext is. And this was a brochure. In fact, somebody sent me this book from New York. It was had gone that far afield. But it was issued by the South African government in order to attract visitors to South Africa. And as you say, describing it's a tourist paradise, talking about all these exotic people, but talking about them, I don't think they intended it to be derogatory, but of course to us that the language is quite shocking, extremely racist. And I wanted to just critique this language because in fact this book was published before the official beginning of apartheid. So it was part of this kind of history of colonialism. I mean, not only here, one can find documents in other colonial countries around the world. And I just wanted to show how language can condition us and can be as imprisoning as a jail cell. So they, they, I've framed them in these steel frames with word, the words actually etched deep into the steel so that you can't just erase the word. And in each one, there is something between us and them, a barrier of some kind, barbed wire or a little chain, which it's again, it's that us and them, the viewer and the object. So your work is extremely political, but I wouldn't like the visitors to only feel that. I think it's also extremely poetic. Uh, it relates also to something very aesthetic. Uh, you're using video in a very specific way um, um, to, to tell a narrative and using sometimes an image and a text in a disconnected way, which I think is the center of the series called Better Lives, where you're going to um, um, f film some people which are, who are still, like, like portraits, they don't move so much and they hear about their own story. So they react a little bit about the story. So it's like, it, like, it's like a moving photograph. It's about the past, it's about uh, personal stories, but also for me, it's a little bit like painting with a camera. So I think this work is uh, very painterly, the way you said it. And so maybe you, you would like to, to say a few words about the history of um, Bella Fufu, uh, coming a uh, guy from, from Congo, who actually speaks a little bit of French. So maybe you chose it for that reason, I don't know. Yes, thank you. Well, I did choose it for that reason. Um, but it was, a, it was also based on the idea of what do you do with video in the age, what do you do with photography in the age of video? Because for many years, before everybody had a camera and a cell phone, each little town would have the photographic studio where people would go to be photographed in a very formal way. And that photograph would be the family photograph It would hang in the home. And I wanted to, so that was part of the idea of this series, that this would be a formal portrait, but it would be a video portrait. So the voiceover is actually the person speaking. We first of all recorded conversations in a studio, quite a long conversation, which I asked questions like, what was your life and how has it been? For you? Why did you come to South Africa and how has it been for you? And would you like to go home again? And then I edited from this down a three and a half minute segment because we were shooting on 35 millimeter film. And I just had three and a half minutes. One roll of film was three and a half minutes. And then I invited everybody to come back dressed in very formal clothes for a portrait. And the backdrop is a black and white photograph of Cape Town because I, it's Table Mountain. Because I, again, I wanted to locate the person in that background as is so often done in those photographic studios where you can you had a selection of backgrounds which you could pose against and then i asked people to look directly into the camera as i played their story to them so they had not previously heard this edited version of their story and i think you can see in the kind of attention that they're hearing it again their own story in their own voice for the first time but you sometimes see little moments of tension, a kind of a tightening of the expression. Right. But, um, and it was made at a time when I was trying to show that these um, immigrants from other parts of Africa were actually contributing to the economy because there has been a lot of xenophobia, there still is in this country, 
from local people who see these strangers coming in, working much harder than they would, and somehow rising quite quickly because they're working hard. So it is very difficult because we have many Zimbabweans here, many Congolese, Sudanese, mm -hmm. because Africa is still seen as an economic South Africa, as a place which is, has got a strong economy. But that's what the work is about. It's to celebrate these immigrants, to say, let's, please, let's accept all these new, new Af South Africans into our country. Yeah, this is something I think French visitors will relate to because uh, French history is made also of uh, immigrants. Yes. Uh, and so this is, I think this is an interesting parallel because between uh, South Africa and France. So maybe I would like to conclude this uh, short virtual visit of the show with a question about your uh, work today. What, what series are you working on? What is your um, reflection about the world today? Well, uh, two questions for you in one question. I'm working on various different things. I think since you saw the film that I made with, um, with Sia and Candice, the one which was a conversation between two young people whose fathers had been killed by the apartheid police. I made another film with Sia and his mother this time. And um, that one was which called... You have, right? That was called that particular, uh, that particular Morning. So I still have the idea that I will perhaps continue more of that series. But I'm also, I've been locked down, I've been confined at home and I've been making drawings based on old colonial first postcards, postcards that were taken in the early, late 19th and early 20th century of these colonial paradises, again, many from West Africa. But I've been draw recreating these landscapes without the people in, which is a reference to the, the slave trade and the way that 12 and a half million Africans were removed from this continent and taken to the Americas during the slave period. So I've been working on those landscapes and drawing. I've been enjoying drawing again. And I'm, in gray, I'm also doing more work around District 6, taking old photographs and engraving them into glass, into sort of shattered pieces of glass, which just reflect on the wall. So, yes, I've been doing various... Very and, active. Yes, very active, very active yes. So it's really too bad we cannot meet you in France, and I really do hope you can come. Later. Thank you, Camille. I hope so too. And thank you so much for this conversation. It's I've really pleasure. appreciated your questions and in talking to you. It was a pleasure. Thank, thank you. you.